Well, we're starting a new book tonight. It happens to be the book of Nehemiah. Going on in this same series, we'll be looking at Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 11 in, in a little bit. Because as always, as you know me now, we studied the book of Jonah, then we studied the book of Esther. I like to give an introduction to the book before we really get started in it. The title of tonight's message is Broken Walls Reflect Broken People. And this series that we're doing in Esther and the 13 chapters that we'll do, I'm titling it Restoring the Broken. Why is that? Because God is all about restoration. Really the main theme of the book of Nehemiah, restoration. He's bringing through the book of Ezra, now here in the book of Nehemiah, he's bringing God's people back into the land. And Nehemiah is going to be called out by God to go back to Jerusalem. He gets that vision. He's, he's a leader that God has empowered and anointing. And he's going to bring him back first to build the physical, to rebuild the physical structure, to give him that security, the walls around the city and the city itself. And, and then God's going to use him to rebuild the lives, restore the lives of the people as well. As Ezra also participates in this book for a short section, they're going to go back to the word of God, the, the worship of God. And so rebuilding the walls, restoring the lives of people. The author of this book, most Bible commentators, they attest to Nehemiah being the author of this book because much of this book is written in the first person. Not all of it, but much of the book is written in the first person account. And it happens to be, in a sense, his memoirs, his telling of the history of the things that were going on. Even the very first verse of the book of Nehemiah in chapter 1 states that the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, chapters 1 through 7, chapter 12 through 13, reflect his own personal writings of that. Now, some believe that Ezra wrote this book itself, because he wrote Ezra. He also is believed to write First and Second Chronicles and things like that. And in the beginning, in, in the early part, what we see here is that the Greek Bible the Hebrew Bible, the early ones, actually combine the book of Ezra and Nehemiah together. And if you look at the Hebrew there and the Greek there, the title of it is just like Ezra slash Nehemiah. The books were combined together itself. It's later in the Latin Vulgate section or translation of the Bible that there appears to be a separation between Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, some also believe that Ezra wrote this book because it's there in Ezra chapter 2, verses 1 through seven, 70 is very similar to chapter 7 of Nehemiah, verses 5 through 73, essentially the same list of people that had returned to the land. But in my opinion, some people will have their debate on this. Some say Ezra, some say Nehemiah. I lean towards Nehemiah. It's okay if you believe it was Ezra. We're not going to have to worry about it. We don't have to debate about it. We don't have to fight about it. But enough about the author. Nehemiah the man, what was this kind of, what do we see here? His name means comfort of Jehovah and the comfort of God. And he was. He really was the comfort of God to the people there in Jerusalem in the midst of all the opposition that was going on in the effort to rebuild the walls and rebuild the city. Just like it was in the book of Ezra when there was all that opposition to rebuild the temple of God. But it got done. We're going to see here in the book of Nehemiah that they rebuild the walls of the city in record time despite all the threats, despite all the opposition. It was a work of God. He came back with a vision. He encouraged the people. They got together. Yeah, let's do this. Let's build the work of God. And they did it. And they did it in record time. And you never, whenever you're doing the work of God, there's always going to be spiritual opposition. There are going to be threats from the outside, people coming against you directly. There are going to be threats from the inside and the internal strife and the division that rises up. But when God's behind it and we're trusting in his faithfulness and his work, it's going to get done. And it's going to get done in his timing and there's going to be victory and there's going to be rejoicing in the midst of it. So we just have to look to God. And when, when the opposition comes, you, you, you fight for your brother. You know, on one hand, you're using the tool. You're working with the tool on the wall. On the other hand, you've got the sword and you're fighting for your brother as you're gathering around the perimeter of the whole area and the ministry, praying it up and seeking the Lord and just seeking his victory. Who was this Nehemiah? Well, we're going to see throughout. He was a man of prayer. We don't see prayer being mentioned in the book of 
Esther that we had just finished and completed. Maybe it was a literary style. Maybe it was a reflection of the condition of the hearts of the people. One thing we know when we've been studying Ezra, going into Esther, going into Nehemiah, you see this up and down roller coaster of their faith. There's times when they're walking with God, they're doing the things of God, they're obeying the law, the Mosaic law, and then there's times that they're lethargic, they're apathetic, they've turned away, they've fallen away, they've fallen into sin. And there needs to be that restoration, that revival. It's kind of like a roller coaster life. There are people out there that seem like they, they've got it together once they come to Christ, and they seem to be steady all the way through. But I'd say most believers, I wouldn't say that we're steady with a fire and a zeal and a passion for God all the way through. We go up and down. And so we need that work of the Holy Spirit. So he's a man of prayer. He was a leader and a visionary. He had a vision to do the work. He had the anointing of God, and he had the authority of God to lead his people. And when God has called a leader, godly people follow. See, you can think you're a leader. We can think that we're a leader. But if no one follows, maybe we're really not a leader. Maybe we really have a gifting of the Spirit in a different matter, right? If no one follows within the, in the work of the ministry and the, the vision that you have for the ministry, well, maybe you're not really the one who's called to be that particular leader. But he was a clear leader. He was a worker and a soldier in the battle. He didn't just go up into the upper room and just kind of sit there and just give orders, bark orders, and tell everyone what to do. He just got in there with his own hands and worked with the people, and he also fought with them. Now, he was a servant of God and his people. When he came back, he didn't just take advantage of the people. You know, the previous governor before him was, was known to be taking extra food and, and had all the money and all the things that was kind of ripping off the people, but he goes in there. And he was a man of integrity. There was no theft. In fact, he even was paying for his own stuff, as we're going to see. So he was a servant to the people. And he was an encourager, and he was also an, an exhorter. And you need both of that as a leader in a ministry. There's a time to encourage. There's a time to comfort. There's a time to build the people up. And the love of God, and in the love of Christ, and just stand by them because... Maybe they're, they're afraid of the work that's going on or, or maybe the, the burdens and the cares of life have just really gotten them down. You just need to go stand by them. And then there was times when he had to be strong, when the priests were getting out of hand, when Malachi, the prophet that goes along with this book towards the last half of the book, towards the end of the book, he was going in and you know they were doing all kinds of things. Their, their type of worship, the way they were serving in a temple was despicable enough to where the Lord was just saying, I wish someone would just close the doors. That was kind of the condition of the people towards the end of the book of Nehemiah. And he had to deal with people. I mean, they were ripping one another off. They were putting one another into slavery, into bondage in terms of their finances because they didn't have enough money to be, be able to buy their food. And so they were endearing themselves, going into slavery in order to pay for those things. And he had to be tough with them. In fact, he even slapped some of them in the face and ripped out their beard. Now, we won't do that today. I hope not. I, hope not. I, I never want to have to do that, right? And I never should do that, right? But he got their attention. He got their attention. That was, that was Nehemiah. Comfort on one side, very strong on the other. Date written. Most Bible scholars believe that Nehemiah wrote this book around 420 B.C., after the events of the book of Nehemiah. Now, the location, they don't really say. Possibly they're in Shushan, the citadel of Persia, one of the four areas, one of the four palaces of the Persian Empire. Of course, when we studied the book of Esther, we were talking about Shushan there when both uh, Queen Esther and Mordecai were there in the citadel. Uh, it's also possible that he wrote it in Jerusalem towards the end of uh, the term there, because he comes, he comes twice to Jerusalem. He comes the first time to rebuild the walls, and he goes back because he told the king that he'd come back and help out for a while. Then he goes back again. And so where he ended up, I don't know. Historical background, kind of like what we ended last week in the book of Esther. Here's some things to give us an understanding of the history and the dates and the events that are going on. The book of Nehemiah occurs 12 years after the close of the book of Ezra. 
Why do I say that? Let's start looking at some things. Ezra chapter 1 through 6. What is the time frame? 539, 538 B.C. to about 516, 515 B.C. 539, 538. Cyrus, the uh, king of Persia, gives a decree. Issues. You can go out, you can go back, and you can rebuild the temple. And then there's all that opposition that goes on, the Tobias and all those guys. The opposition that goes on, they, they struggle. The work of the temple is stopped. And then finally, King Darius issues a decree that allows them to finish the temple itself. So there was a start of the temple. There was a stoppage of the temple. There was a restart of the work of the temple. Zerubbabel had been called out. He was the one that led the first group of people back from the Persian Empire and captivity there. And they were there to build the temple. And in the midst of that time, God had sent the prophets Zechariah and Haggai. So if you're studying the book of Ezra, go study the books of Zechariah and Haggai that were giving the message. Zechariah was encouraging that Jerusalem is the place, man. This is the place. Continue in the work. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. He gave all these various visions of the near and also for the last times. And the book of Haggai, you know, they had been discouraged. The work had stopped. And they had gone back to their homes and they were rebuilding their paneled houses. And Haggai the prophet was saying, hey guys, you know why things are getting tough in your life? You know why your pockets are, have holes in them and the money is kind of falling out and, and the things that are happening to you? Well, it's because you're building your homes and you're making them real nice, but you're not building the house of the Lord. And so they were prophesying that at that time. So that was Ezra chapter 1 through 6 time frame. Then between, as we talked about at the end of last week, between Ezra 6, the finishing of the temple, and Ezra chapter 7, Ezra coming back with a remnant, Esther chapters 1 through 10. That's what was occurring there. Why? Because it's a time frame of 483 through 473 B.C. that the book of Esther occurs. King Ahasuerus or Xerxes in the Greek or in the NIV versions was there at that time. For, he reigned from 485 to 465 B.C. in the Persian Empire. He raises up, of course, Esther and Mordecai and God saves the Jewish people great victory. It, it ended, the book of Esther ended with such celebration and joy because up to just under 76,000 people of the enemies of the Jews had been killed. They had been taken out. That God had used the government of the Persian Empire and used Esther and Mordecai and that decree of life overturned the decree of death of Haman. And so there was great victory. There was great jubilation but yet soon after that the enemies of the Jews raise up again. Maybe some of them survived that time of death sentence in Esther. Or maybe they were taught and they remembered that, oh yeah, look what happened to our people and things like that. The, the Jews and the victory that they had, we don't know. But either way, they come back and the opposition's going to build again. Then Ezra chapter 7 through 10, when was the time frame? Uh, 458 to 457 B.C. Ezra returns to Jerusalem, 458 BC. He finishes the work, deals with the marriage issues to unbelievers, and the book of Esther finishes up in 457 BC. And King Artaxerxes was the king of that time. So Ezra 7 through 10, King Artaxerxes, the follower of King Ahasuerus, or the follower of King Xerxes. Then we have now Nehemiah chapter 1 through 13, the time frame, 445 to 425 B.C. Do you see why I put Esther between 6 and 7 and I break things up? covers a great period of time. Artaxerxes ruled from 464 through 424 B.C. That's why we see him being dealt with in Ezra 7 through 10 and also through the book of Nehemiah itself. So he's the, the one that gives the third return. Ezra was the second return of people back to Jerusalem. Nehemiah, he brings back the third people. And what's he addressing when he gets back? You know, again, great opposition to the building of the walls of the city and the city of Jerusalem itself. But he's addressing, again, that intermarriage between believers and unbelievers. He's dealing with the enslavement of Jews by Jews in terms of taking advantage of one another, charging excessive usury fees, you know, in order to recover 
the loans that they had handed out. And he's dealing with the problems with the priests, not the problems, the trouble with the tribbles of the uh, Star Trek era, the good Star Trek era as far as I'm concerned. But back then, if you, get, if you understand, you got it. But the problems with the priests and the issue that they were having, and Malachi the prophet is prophesying during this time. Main purpose, main theme of Nehemiah, just as we talked about in the beginning of tonight, restoration. So we're continuing on from the book of Ezra. God was at work to restore his people. Just in the same in the book of Ezra, it's, it's about restoration. It's about returning to the land. It's about renewal. It's about restoration. It's about building a temple. It's about restoring the worship. It's about getting things right with God. And here again, we have this section where restoration, renewal, the 70 years of God's discipline upon Israel is up. He had already sent back. It was up at the time when the decree that Cyrus was told to send the people out and go back and rebuild the temple. That's done. That work's ended. And the first two groups are back, and now we have the third group that's about to be done. The temple had been rebuilt, but the walls in the city remained to be rebuilt. And when I'm talking about restoration as the main thing, I broke it down into four R's, not just reading, writing, arithmetic. No, it... We've got four R's here. Return. But he was telling them, return to God in repentance. When we're coming back to the Lord, when we've backslidden and we've gone away and we've gone off to our own ways and the ways of the flesh and fallen into sin and getting into all kinds of trouble, the first thing God is telling us is to return. Return in repentance from your sin, from the apathy maybe, the lethargy. And that's what we're going to see when we talk about Malachi's prophecy towards the end of the book of Nehemiah. They were cold-hearted. They had a cold-hearted indifference to the things of God. And it was showing in their offerings. It was showing in their temple service. And that's why God was saying, hey, just close the doors here. So the second step, renew. So one, repent, return to God. The second thing, renew your commitment to follow God's word, to follow the Lord completely. So there's one aspect, return and renew your faith in God. Restore your fellowship with God through your worship, through your time, your devotion with Him, the Word of God, your daily devotions. See, God would have us do that. Are we restoring that fellowship? Are we drifting away? Maybe the times in our devotional life and our study of the Word of God and the seeking of the Lord and maybe even in times of our worship, maybe it's just dry. Maybe there just needs to be a renewal of the Spirit of God within our lives. We can have that. And when we return and we renew our commitment to God, then revive. God is the one who revives us. He brings that fire back into our lives. You know, not only the fire of purification, but more so the fire of the Spirit of God that gives us the ability and the power to do the work of God and to do it with enthusiasm. When you're doing the work of God, the, the gifting and the calling that he has given to you with the individual gifts of the Spirit, man, there should be a passion there. There should be a, a fire there. There should be a hunger there. And if there isn't, maybe we can go back and we can seek the Lord and ask to be filled again by the Spirit of God. The empowering upon the Spirit of, of us by the Spirit of God to do the work of ministry and the passion and the heart and the work of God. So God revives the hearts and the spirit of those who return and renew and restore their lives with him. So we do need to be revived. We do need to be restored. We need God's presence because we have a tendency to fall away. Just like sheep going astray, we have a tendency to fall away. There's that passion and there's that zeal. There was a passion and there was a zeal in the 1960s and the 1970s when the Jesus movement was here. Then things became regular and going on. And what's happened since that time? What's happened in the churches, the attendance and all those things and the fire and the passion for God? It's kind of died off. We really need a new work of God in these days to reach this generation. I believe that God wants to reach every generation. Now, we have prophetic scriptures that kind of like in the last days of the church of Laodicea that just the reality when, hey, I'm rich. I've got all that I need. I don't need God. I'll just kind of leave Jesus out at the door and do some other things. And Jesus is there knocking at the door of the church. Hey, let me in. Do you mind if I come back in? It is my church. <laughs> but we, we, we tend to lose that spiritual fervor. 
We have a complacency, a, a lethargy, a falling asleep, a falling away. We go in cycles. And I wrote, a sleeping and dead face stops the work of God when the cares of the world and trouble or opposition arise. Sometimes, I mean, I'm praying regularly for the, the Christian believers in North Korea. You know, the things that they're going through. You know, their prayers aren't just bless all the children of the earth and give them my money and my Rolls Royce. No, their prayers are probably like, Lord, just give me strength to make it through the day. Lord, can you please provide some food? I'm really hungry in this prison. And Lord, give me the power and the strength to, to share with my guard the very one who's going to execute me tomorrow, that he might come to Christ. You know, they're, 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 and yet they're probably, their faith is, is probably great. They don't have the opportunity to get the word of God like we do and to study it like we do. They, their, their faith is, is simple. And you know what? The things that happen throughout the world, we have brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world to pray for and right here as well. And so it's kind of a reminder that that sleepiness, that dead faith can stop the work of God when we lose that passion, that heart, and that hunger for the things of God. When the things and the cares of the world, no, I've got to take my kids. I've got to, they've got soccer pra practice tonight. They've got um, school tomorrow night and special assembly. They're in theater. They're doing music this day. But where are they here in the Word of God and, and getting instruction in the Word of God? And the trouble, the opposition that can rise up and, and take us out. They could discourage. It took them out in that day. They just went home. They gave up. But especially in these last days, we see many things going on. We need to gather together more and more in, in fellowship, more and more, just even the men's retreat. If you haven't signed up, I don't know if it's too late or not, but I'm sure if you showed up and paid your way, something might work out. I'm, don't quote me on that. But Carl, Carl Pete, you know, and things like that. But, you know, get up and go. Get back into the Word of God. Ask God to restore and to revive. And maybe that's just where we're at. Maybe the things that have been going on, the cares of the world, and we've just lost our passion, and we've just lost our zeal, and, and God would be saying, it's okay. Just return. Go back, renew, restore, and I'll revive. God will do the work of revival within our lives. Revival's never been hyped up emotional worship. Hyped up emotional, exciting, and fun services. Revival is always started with a heart that wants to return to God and repents of its sin, and seeks the Lord. And when does the Holy Spirit pour out in power? After those things. Not by jumping up and down. Not by flying around like eagles through a room and calling that revival. Right? Okay, that's enough. Let's go on. Let's get into Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And I title this section, Broken Lives, Broken People. What our, our title was, Broken walls reflect broken people, but now we're just going to look at broken lives, broken people, because that's the condition of the people there in Jerusalem. So let's look here at verse 1. You know, last week I, I talked about my glasses. I went to the eye doctor and things like that and got my new glasses. Well, I find out that I have the three levels, the nearsightedness for upfront reading and the mid-distance for the computer and then the, the far distance for the vision and things like that. Well, you can't get all three of them real good at, at the same time. You can get upfront reading to make that, you know, appear better. You can get mid-distance, and you can get always the far distance, but you can't get all three. So I'm probably going to have to get a tablet, you know, and do something different. So I'm trying something new. I tried. I, I spent the money to get new glasses. It's just not working. So let's look here, verses 1 through 4. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. It came to pass in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah and asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had arrived, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. 
So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. We've got a lot of lessons here in regards to this section. We're going we're gonna to see applications for prayer and how we can pray and how Nehemiah prayed and some applications for us. We're also going to see some applications for ministry, the calling to ministry, the various ministries that we serve within and God's calling on us and how those things work and how he starts in those things. But here, when we're starting here in the first four verses, we have the month of Kislev. When is that? November, December time frame of the Jewish calendar, the month of Kislev. And it says here it was in the 20th year of the king or the 20th year. It's in chapter 2, verse 1 that you see in the month of Nisan, the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. So who is the king at this time? It's King Artaxerxes, even at the start of Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. So that's what we see. He's in the city of Shushan or the citadel of Shushan, one of the four main palaces of the Persian Empire of the day. This happened to typically be the winter palace, and this is where Esther was. This was where Mordecai was. This was where King Ahasuerus was. This was where the previous king to Ahasuerus was, Darius. And this, of course, is here where Nehemiah is well in the Persian Empire. Hanani, it happens to be Nehemiah's brother. Not just a brethren, but there were people from Judah that came back with Hanani. And Hanani, we're going to see later in the book of Nehemiah, that he's also appointed to a work there in Jerusalem itself. So they came back. They came back to report on the condition of the people there and also of the city and the condition of Jerusalem itself. And what did they find? They found that the people were in great distress. What does that mean in this section as you look it up? It means adversity and affliction. So they, it wasn't just they were going through adversity and affliction. They were under great distress. They were under great adversity, great affliction. It was a tough time. And they were under great reproach or great disgrace. These were the things that they weren't, in, they weren't a people that were encouraged. They weren't out there really doing the work of God. They were discouraged. They were beaten up. They were downtrodden. They were going through great affliction and great opposition against them. And sometimes as you go through many afflictions, you go through many trials and difficulties. It just beats you up. It just wears you out. And all you want to do is just like, I just want to go home and, and I want to lie down. I want to take a break from ministry for a while. And that's the time that you really have to dig into God. That's the time that you just really have to hold on. Because what's happening? He's carrying you. Because you just don't have the strength. You just don't have the ability to do it yourself. You're tired. You're worn out. You're beat up. And you're wondering. You're crying out to God. Your prayers are just, help. Save me. Deliver me. Lord, you've got to do something here. I can't do it. I can't heal myself. I can't save myself. I can't deliver myself out of this prison. I can't deliver myself out of this prison of sin. It's impossible. And you're just crying out. You're just fighting you're in the midst of affliction. You're in the midst of adversity. And it feels like you're just being disgraced. You know, you wonder, it's like, God, are you against me? And that's when the power of God and the work of God is really strong as, as he's carrying you. And the, and the spirit of God is even praying for you on your behalf in the very words that you can't speak, right? And that's, that's the mercy of God. What's happening with the walls in the city? They're broken down. The gates are burned with fire. In that day, it was very important. You needed a, a city wall around the city itself, around the kingdom that you were at. It was for your security. So when it says that the walls were broken down and they were burned, man, they were insecure to the invading armies all around them. Remember the land of Canaan as the Israelites were coming into the land and Joshua was leading them in battle. They were oftentimes fighting against various kings throughout the land. And they had to go and they had to attack the cities. They had to take down the gates. And there were even times when the Lord took down the walls regarding Jericho, right? And they just entered in and there was just great victory. So that was 
But the broken walls I see here is the reflection of the broken lives of the people. The insecure condition. When we've fallen away from God, how secure are we when we're walking in our flesh? That's when people oftentimes question their salvation. They don't feel secure in the presence of God because of where they are, and they just have to return. Things have to be built back up again. They were failing in their faith. They were falling into sin. They were walking away from the work of the ministry and the work of God. And it was necessary, and it's going to happen. God's repent, their repentance, reconciliation with God, the restoration and renewal. And God was going to raise up Nehemiah. He's calling Nehemiah. Nehemiah, you're the guy. And he was going to equip him and send him out and give him the vision to first build the physical, to build the walls, and then to build the spiritual. When it talks about here the walls being torn down, we remember back in, what was it, 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 8 through 10. Originally, it was Nebuchadnezzar who came in and he destroyed the temple. He destroyed the city. Remember, he took all the gold and the silver and all the goods and things like that. He destroyed the walls back around 586 B.C. However, this time, it's different. The temple was completed, and we have to look back to the book of Ezra, chapter 4. I'm going to look at here, Ezra, chapter 4. I'm going to look at some scriptures here that talk about what was going on. In order to understand Ezra, chapter 4, and it's speaking about this opposition, it's speaking about different periods of history of opposition. First of all, the resistance to the rebuilding of the temple in the first five verses. Then it talks about the, the rebuilding of Jerusalem being opposed. And then it's going to finish off with the very last verse and refers back to the shutting down of the building of the temple. It just does some strange stuff there. I don't know what happened there, but it did. It's just going all over the place here. But it, it says here in verse 6, just for example, in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, so in, in, in that time, so Xerxes is talking about that time, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. So that was before this time. But then it says, in the days of Artaxerxes also, and he lists these groups of men had a complaint against the Jews. But really the two guys, the two characters here that really caused the trouble and caused the walls, because after they had built the temple and they finished it, they actually started working on the walls. They actually started working on rebuilding the city. But here, there's this letter from this guy named Rehum, from Rehum the commander there in verse 9, Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their companions, the rest of their demonic cohorts of opposition. And it says here in verse 11, to King Artaxerxes from your servants, from the men of the region beyond the river, and so forth, let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city and are finishing its walls. So there was a time in the earlier reign of King Artaxerxes where they were trying to rebuild the walls in the city before Nehemiah came. And so he's basically saying, let it be known to the king that if this city is built and the walls completed, they will not pay tax or tribute or custom and the king's treasury will be diminished. Hey, if you let these Jews rebuild the city and the walls, you're not going to get your taxes. You're not going to have the king's treasury that you can pull from for whatever you want to do. You're not going to have money. You're not going to have cash. So down even down to verse 16. We inform the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, the result will be that you will have no dominion beyond the river. So they're writing this letter, said not only are you going to have your taxes, but this rebellious people, and go back and look at the, the records of the kings of the, the, of the empire of Persia and verify this, but not, not only taxes, but you're not going to have dominion. And then King Artaxerxes replied in response, and I'm not going to read all that. I'm going to look down to verse 22 when he basically says, take heed now that you do not fail to do this. What? To stop the work. Why should damage increase to hurt to the hurt of the kings? 
Why should damage increase to her of the kings? And then it says, verse 23, Now when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum, Shimshai the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews and by force of arms made them cease. So somehow, it doesn't listen specifically, somehow during that time, what had happened? Well, the walls were torn down again. The very work that they had started to rebuild on the walls and in the city itself had been torn down and it was burned. And that was the condition that Nehemiah says. And then he talks about here. So he had an awareness. He gained an awareness that gave him a burden for the work. He became aware of the condition of the people. He came, became aware of the condition of the city and the walls. Now he has a burden for this work. He's distressed. And as it talks about, back to Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4, it says, So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He took action on it. He had a burden for, he had a heart for the people. I can't sit here and do nothing in this situation. And that's the beginning of ministry oftentimes. God may make us aware of a situation, a need. And he burdens our heart for it. May not be burdened someone else's heart. You may present it to someone else and they just kind of look at you. What? But they they burden your heart. What do they start with? He starts with prayer and fasting. The prayer and fasting that they were, and mourning that they were doing a lot in Esther's time, right? When we studied the book of Esther. But now he's, he's praying, he's, he's fasting before the God of heaven. He's seeking the Lord. What do I do? And that's what you need to do. When you sense that call, when you sense that burden, bring it to the Lord in prayer. Take some time. Don't just do a, a simple two-word prayer, but spend some time with him. You want that confirmation. That confirmation will give you the confidence that God's going to equip you and that he's going to empower you for the work of ministry. So it often begins with a, an awareness of the condition of the people that God wants you to reach. The problem is identified. The burden was upon the heart to do something for Nehemiah in this situation. He goes to the Lord in prayer. The very calling, the equipping, and the sending of a leader out to do the work to bring the solution to the issue would come later. Not right at this moment. Now let's move into chapter 1 verses 5 through 11 now let's start looking at some applications for prayer and ministry let's look here at verse 5 and now he says he was praying over many days then he gets specific then he lists one specific prayer that he was praying and he says here in verse 5 and i said i pray lord god of heaven O great and awesome god you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love with those who love who love you and observe your commandments please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant which i pray before you now day and night for the children of israel your servants and he goes on and confess the sins of the children of israel which we have sinned against you both my father's house and i have sinned we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinance which you commanded your servant Moses. Just to kind of stop there, just kind of give a summary of some of these things. So he prays specifically, and he prays to the Lord, to the God of heaven. And he calls him the O oh, great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant, the covenant God. The, the very God, the Lord, if back in the book of Exodus, when the Lord revealed himself to Moses, I am, I will be, meaning I am, I will be, I will be whatever the need. So he remembers the covenant God, the covenant of the Old Testament covenant itself, the God of love, really in place of mercy, because he says keep your covenant and mercy, and the translation there is really love. You keep your love, you keep your mercy, you keep your covenant with those who love you and observe your commandments. You know, the one who loves God is the one who obeys God, right? And he goes on, you observe, you please, Lord, I want you to be attentive. 
Pay attention to what I'm saying. Open your eyes. See the condition. Hear my prayer, which I pray before you now day and night, not only for himself, but also for the children of Israel. He had a heart for the people. He was interceding, right? Intercession of prayer is, is important when you're eating, interceding on behalf of someone else. Then he goes on into confession. That word for confession here means to throw or cast off. To throw or cast off your sins by confessing them to the Lord. And that's what you're doing when you're confessing your sins before the Lord and He forgives you and He remembers them more. You're casting them off yourself. The burden's off yourself and you're throwing them on to the Lord. So not, not only is he confessing his own sins, but he's confessing the sins of the nation, just like Daniel did in chapter 9 when he realized that it's been about 70 years. I remember the prophet Jeremiah saying that we're going to be in captivity for about 70 years. So I, I went and sought the Lord on what's going to happen for the nation of Israel. And he tells him the, the 70 weeks, the 70 times 7, the 490 years that were applicable for Israel. And the angel came and and spoke to him. And later on in chapter 10, in a vision, when you see the prince of Persia that was resisting the angel that was coming to reveal him the coming days of the Persian Empire and the Greek Empire. Why is it that we have s such a trouble with Iran? Because there's a demonic prince of Persia over the land that even Michael was called in to help out in Daniel chapter 10. Why is it that Iran's been at war with us since 1979 and killing our soldiers all over the place? Remember the 400 Marines that were killed back in the 1980s with the, the barracks being blown up in Lebanon, in Beirut? Remember that? And then shelling, they were all mad that we were shelling the, the Shiite. Well, those were Shiites. Those were Shiite Muslims there in Iran. The, really the the beginning, the awareness of terrorism for us outside of the captivity and the hostages that the Iranians took at the embassy at, in the last days of uh, the Carter administration and then the very day going into the Reagan administration when they're released. Do you remember that? Well, there, there's a, a battle zone going on. That's why Iran is, they, they've got a demonic force, and I'm not one who's all into these territorial spirits, but here in this case, Michael the archangel is fighting for the nation of Israel. And, he, and he's going to do it again in Revelation chapter 12. He's going to fight again when, when Michael and his angels fight against Satan's angels and Satan is thrown out of heaven for good. He still has access right now to accuse the brethren. But that's why there's such a battle with Iran. There's a, there's a prince of Persia. And that's why the, the spiritual condition is that, man, it, it may be acted out in the flesh between nations but there's really a spiritual warfare behind it that's going on in that place. Okay, where did I go? But anyways, you got that. Now back here, verse 8, chapter 1, remember. So confess and remember. Now he's going before the Lord and said, Lord, remember, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. So he's going back to the Old Testament law that was spoken, if you are unfaithful, you will be scattered among the nations. And that's been the history of the Jewish people. They've been often scattered amongst the nations because they've been unfaithful. But then it says, it says, verse 9, but if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. So he promised them also in the Old Testament law, but if you return to me, if you, you restore your fellowship with me, if you renew your faith in me, and, and you show it in your obedience to my commandments, no matter where you are, no matter where I've dispersed you in discipline, I'll bring you back to the land. And he's done that, right? He's done that a number of times, even to this day, even Ezekiel the prophet. But this time they've gone back into the land not because they've repented, Ezekiel said, and the raising up of the, the dead bones and putting sinews on him and flesh and giving the spirit. He said, I brought you back into the land because of my namesake, my holiness, not yours. But they're there for good now. 
He, the Lord's brought him back. But back in that time, hey, Lord, remember your word. Remember what it said that you promised that if we return, you'll bring us back into the land, back to the city that you've chosen as a dwelling place for your name. Has God chosen Jerusalem for the Palestinians? No. He's chosen Jerusalem as what? It's his dwelling place, right? People are trying to divide the land, but we have to realize it's God's land. And he's chosen Jerusalem in particular. It's not to be divided up. The Palestinians can live at peace in Israel, but that land is Israel's, according to God's word. God's chosen this place, and it's, it's the very place that he's coming back to. So all the events may come out. You know, the one world leader and the Antichrist, he may come out and say, and give a, and sign a peace treaty with many, as it talks about in Daniel 9. It's not going to work. When they say peace and safety, sudden destruction is going to come upon them, right? The only one who's going to bring true praise is when the Lord returns and sets up Jerusalem again as his physical dwelling place, and he rules and reigns for a thousand years. His dwelling place. I've chosen this for my name. And it says here, now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Oh, Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive. Lord, listen, be attentive to me, to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. So it wasn't just Nehemiah who was a godly man. There was still a remnant of godly people that had come back to Jerusalem and they were ready to go. And let your servant prosper this day. I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. What man? King Artaxerxes, who's going to go and ask for favor and mercy to do something about it after he prays. Lord, grant me favor. And then it ends there. For I was the king's cupbearer. Basically, a high position there in the Persian Empire. You essentially tasted the drink of the king. And if you died, well, then that was poison and the king is safe. So you needed someone who was loyal. You needed someone who was faithful. Someone you can count on. Someone who was, had integrity, and that was Nehemiah. And so he was the cupbearer before the king, and he was cupbearer, and the Lord was going to send him back. So what can we see? What are some applications here when we look at this prayer? Well, you've got to pray to God, right? You, you can't pray to any God. You've got to pray to the God of the Bible, the one who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You can pray to all other kinds of entities and make your sacrifices. It's not going to make a difference. You can only pray to the one true God. You've got to recognize, number two, who God is. He's the great and awesome God. He's the faithful one who keeps his covenant. He's the one who pours out his love, his mercy, and his kindness to those who love and obey him. And so, Nehemiah, I remember this about you, Lord, and I expect you to be the same as in the past. Even it says in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? So you pray to God. You recognize in your prayer who God is. He's the great and awesome God. He's the one who can do great and mighty things, right? It's not just, oh, Lord, bless all the people in the world and, you know, heal everybody and, and, and do good for everybody and bring peace to the earth. No, be specific. Nehemiah was specific in his prayer. He had a purpose. He sensed a call. He had that burden. He wanted to do something about it. Number three, expect God to be alert to your prayer and need. Why? Because you have confidence in the Lord. That since we have his righteousness, we can come before the throne of God in boldness and in confidence that he'll hear and answer the need according to his will. 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence we have in God that if we, this is our confidence that we have God, that we, if we, I can't even remember that. Yeah, I'll look it up. I usually have it right off the tip of my tongue. It must be my old age. First John chapter 5, verse 14. This, this is confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. There it is. I didn't have to look it up. Just a mind blank. We have confidence in going before God. You know? We can ask, and we can expect. Then he, the confess and to intercede on behalf of God's people. Confess our sins. Confess our sins on behalf of the nation. Intercede on behalf of the people of Israel. You know what? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, right? 
So we confess our sins before God as part of our prayer. He took responsibility for himself, and he took responsibility for the nation of Israel. You know, make it right with God, right, before him. Be real with him. Own your stuff and ask for his mercy, and he'll grant it. Uh, remember. Remember the word of God. Lord, remember what you said. So we're, not, we're not looking back to the word of God and remembering so that we can get our blessing pack covenant, so that we can speak words of incantations, and God has to act on our behalf because we have this, these words that are a force of faith that God has to act to. No, it's, it's, it's not about that. It's about remembering the word of God, going back, applying it appropriately for the situation. What's it talk about in Romans 10, 17? That, that faith comes from hearing the word and, and from the word of Christ, right? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the, and the message from the word of Christ. So that's where we have our confidence from. The word of God gives us faith to pray and to apply it at the right time in the right situation and trust God and remember what he has done and what he will do. It gives us confidence to pray. And then ask and don't demand. You know, there are people that demand God to act on their behalf. He tells them, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be open. Matthew 7, 7 through 8. So there's a lot of application there. Because he remembered God's word. He could ask in confidence. Lord, hear my prayer. Give me favor before the king. So in addition to this, what are a couple other applications that we hear, have here to finish off in the next couple of minutes? Applications for God's calling in our life, calling to ministry itself. And one application I wrote, ministry often starts with an awareness of the need. We talked about that with Nehemiah. We're just following along with what happened with Nehemiah. We have an awareness of the need of ministry. We have a burden to do something about it. Someone else might not have that burden, but you have that burden. And what did he do? We pray and we seek his face. You just don't go out and act on it on your own. You, you spend some time in prayer. You seek the Lord. You seek his confirmation. And then what happens? God confirms the calling. He confirms it by his word, as we see in the New Testament as well. He confirms it in prayers. We seek his face and sit at his feet and listen to his still small voice. He confirms it by the spirit of God moving us in that direction. He confirms it by the circumstances of our lives as well. Things, doors open, doors shut, right? And he confirms it by the people that you're in fellowship with, the people that you know, people that know you as well, and they sense the same thing. They're praying for you. And they say, yeah, man, you really are called to do this work of ministry, that people that you are in fellowship. And he confirms it by the leadership that we are under as well. I think Pastor Gary as well. Then what happens? God equips. He empowers us. And he sends the person out that he has called to do the work. Some people might think that they have the calling, but they haven't spent the time before the Lord to have that confirmation. And you can go out and you can do the work in ministry and it just all falls apart. And, and you go back with the tail between your legs because it's been a failure and it really wasn't a calling of God. And that, those possible failures can kind of scare us to go out. When I went out to New York and I was all, all on my own, there I was up in Wisconsin, and I realized, it's like, man, I'm in the wrong place. And I had to kind of redirect my life and seek the Lord, and I end up there in Long Island, New York. So he equips, he empowers the person he calls to do the work. And when he calls us, he equips us, we spent time with them. We had the confirmation of people, the confirmation of leadership, the confirmation of the word of God, the confirmation by the spirit of God. Man, we have the confidence to go out. But maybe the, the time to go out is not right at the time we think it is. It, it's the waiting. You have to wait, right? As Tom Petty once said, but the waiting is the hardest part, right? The waiting, the perseverance, the preparation that's necessary, the testing in the midst of that. Because you know, once you sense that calling and you have that confidence, then that testing and the trials come in those things. If, you, if you've gone out to be a pastor, you've gone out to be a missionary, or you started a work of ministry here in the church itself, you've gone through those testings and trials. But 
we have to wait for God's timing. It's got to be in his timing. And the testing and the waiting is the hardest part, but it's always going to be in God's timing and his way. Our last application here in terms of calling for ministry. God often calls and equips the available more than the able. Doesn't mean he won't call and equip the able. Nehemiah is one who was called. He was in a high position. Sometimes he calls in the low position. Sometimes he calls in the high positions. It's his will. It's his calling. Sometimes when we're called with a lot of ability, we tend to rely on our own ability and our own strength. That we rely less on God. And God kind of has to take us through situations to where we fail and we realize, it's like, I guess I'm not that able. You know, if we're in the vine... We're attached, we're abiding in Christ. That's when we really produce fruit. And so God can equip the unable, and he could also change the equipping of the able. Those with abilities and those without them, right? There are those who feel the need to lead, but God may not have called them. Sometimes people come to the church, you know what, God's called me to be the pastor here. They have the, the, they have the, the need to lead, but then... They realize that they're not called and there's opposition against it and there's not the confirmation. Then they have the need to leave. Because they just, I'm, I'm getting out of here. Maybe I'm taking some people with me. But then they have the need to leave. Therefore, what do you do? Pray and prepare. So when you sense that calling, pray and prepare. Prepare in the word of God. Prepare in the time of God. Wait and watch. So don't go out in a hurry. Don't do the work of the ministry in a hurry. Wait and watch for God and his timing. Then arise and go. When you have that confidence and you have that timing, don't sit back and say, no, we can't do it. We can't go and there's giants in the land. Arise and go in the confidence of God. Arise and build. Just like Nehemiah. He was going to arise and go to Jerusalem. He was going to rise and build the walls. Then arise and fight. Because when you start in ministry... In various aspects, there's a fight, there's a battle, there's opposition, and you're going to have to fight in the spiritual realm. Then arise and persevere. There's going to be testings and trials and to test your faithfulness in the midst of it, if you're really going to hold fast to it. Then arise and rejoice in the victories when you've persevered, when you've finished the work of God. There's the victories. The victories and the fruit oftentimes don't come right away. And that, that's the hard part. You go out in ministry, you go out, maybe the church is struggling, it's, nothing seems to be happening, and you're looking inward and you're saying, man, there's just nothing here, I, I just got just to gotta quit it, you know. And you go home. And the Lord was saying, if you just waited another six months, I would have really brought the fruit. And those are things that we learn. Do we get all these things right in the first place? No, we don't. We learn in those steps. We learn in those steps of ministry, and, and God uses us. Perseverance is a great part. Waiting on the Lord is a great part of ministry itself. And not just going out and expecting great fruit and great numbers. There's some guys that go out, and God really blesses the work, and they have a tremendous ministry. A lot of people get discipled. A lot of people get saved. But most pastors and missionaries that go out, man, it's hard ground and soil and toiling for many years and you're really wondering did I do the right thing did I go to the right place am I really hearing from God and if you don't have that encouragement that really only comes from the Lord because if you're just looking at numbers of people to determine your success you know God can have great success in a few people that you've discipled over a period of time, you might raise up the next Billy Graham, right? And that's the only person you really raise up. And that's the fruit of your ministry. What was the fruit of Jeremiah's ministry? Did anyone convert? I'm trying to think. I don't think so. Did anyone convert into Jeremiah's ministry? No, I think uh, he had threats and he was put into a cistern and all those things the whole time. But he was faithful to the end, Right? He was faithful unto the end because he stayed with the Lord. He was ready to quit. He was ready to give up, but he was faithful to the end. And that's what we need in these last days. We need to be faithful to the end. 
in the work of God, in the work of ministry. Maybe we failed in ministry at times and we just said, I've had enough. Get back in it if God's calling. He's put that burden upon your heart and that calling back into it. And realize it's going to be tough. You need your brothers and sisters to encourage you and to lift you up and be praying for you and, and building you up and exhorting you to godly living in these last days. Don't give up. Hold on. Hold fast. The Lord's return is near. It'll be in his timing and his time and his day. But be encouraged that, that God knows exactly where we're at, what he's called us to do, and hang in there till the end. And then the reward will come. The fruitfulness you'll see when you see the people in heaven that you reached. Maybe that person on the street who went out and saved or really prayed and shared the word of God with many others. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word tonight. And Lord, I, I pray for these last days. I, I pray for this church as well. Lord, that uh, so many people have been here a long time and and uh, it's just tough in ministry these days. And we're wanting to see the fruit. We're wanting to see the evidence and see the victories. And sometimes it's just a battle. It's just hard out there. And so we pray that you just build your people up. You strengthen them. You encourage them. You give us perseverance and strength for these last days. That you do a great and awesome work to build us up and to encourage us and to help us persevere. Let's finish well doing the work of God, building the work of ministry together, fighting for one another, lifting up one another's arms to glorify you. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.